everybody, and welcome back to a new season of American Muslim Project. I'm Asad Butt. As a lot of you know, who are regular listeners, we've been doing this for a couple of years now. I think we started during the pandemic, actually. And, you know, we've continuously been iterating on this podcast. We've been trying different things from season to season um, to try to keep it interesting, try to keep it fresh. We've tried different types of stories different types of formats, all in the effort to give color to what is happening in the American Muslim community to American Muslims and beyond. And so for today's episode, we're going to try something that we haven't done before. I don't think maybe maybe we have. We're going back to my news anchor roots and maybe my sister who will join us later will will tell you a little bit about my my past (laughs) history. But we're going to be focusing on headlines that are happening across the country, across the world that are affecting the American Muslim community. And my guest, as I mentioned, is my sister, Nadia. But Nadia is uh, has been a previous guest to the American Muslim Project podcast, and she's listened to a bunch of episodes and has been a sounding board on this. She is a consultant focused on diversity, equity and inclusion in the business world or just, I guess, in general. Um, and is the host of another podcast on the Rafaelion Network called The Inclusive Collective. We have, we've actually played a couple of those episodes, uh, I think, on on this podcast feed or clips of it. Maybe I'm making that up. Who knows? Uh, but it is an award winning podcast. Um, and so with that, I'll uh, yeah introduce my sister Nadia. Nadia, thanks for for joining American Muslim Project on this. Now I guess we're going to call it season three opener. Thanks for having me, Asa. I always love hearing my siblings describe the work that I do. Right? Like, not kind of (laughs) yes and no. Um, I don't know. You're ABD, all but dissertation, right? All but dissertation. I inshallah hope to defend this year. Oh, inshallah means it won't happen though. Now (laughs) that's what Dad says. He's like, anytime you end a sentence, you know what I was thinking about, Asa. Do you know how many other podcasts there are out there where there's siblings that co-host something? Oh, I don't know. Yeah. Is there a lot? There's a lot. When you Google like sibling podcast hosts, there's oh. a bunch of like articles that will show up. But oh, that's the most cool. famous one is Kate and Oliver Hudson. Oh. Who Kate have Hudson a podcast. Actress? Okay. Yeah. She they um have a podcast called sibling revelry do they have a third sister that also doesn't show up on the podcast (laughs) maureen actually asked maureen is our sister for listeners that don't know and we were at a party on friday night and she was like telling people about the work i do and award-winning podcast oh award-winning and how us how you've been on the podcast before as a guest and she was so bitter and she was like i've never been on it (laughs) Which is true. <laughs> that is true. You and she's it? probably like the most accomplished of all of us. I yeah, probably should true. have her yeah, on it. Yeah. Well, we're, we're definitely going to get her back on this podcast moving moving forward uh, because, you know, as part of this revamp, we're going to be looking a lot at the election coming up this year because that's going to be huge news for the American Muslim community. And we'll talk a little bit about that coming up. Mm-hmm. Um, and our sister is uh, a local elected politician deep into Massachusetts um, Democratic politics. Um, and so I think her stance on some things will be um, pretty, pretty interesting for sure. Um, but now that should we get started? Let's do it. Yeah. OK, so the first story, I think now the, uh, this is by far the biggest story that we are all talking about um, in the American Muslim community. And that is, of course, what's going on in Gaza and Palestine, um, the attack on Gaza, the war on Gaza, however you want to describe it. Um, you know, before we we kind of go into the discussion, you know, I think where we're at today and we're recording this on a Wednesday, um, you know, uh, here are the numbers. There are almost 25,000 people dead. Two thirds of them are women and children, 60,000 injuries. Thousands have been reported missing. Um, 85% of Gazans are displaced and there is widespread hunger and disease that, is essentially, you know, caused by the blockade um, uh, of the state uh, uh, by the state of Israel on um, the people in Gaza. There have been three hundred and fifty thousand homes either destroyed or damaged, and you know these are just some of the numbers, Nadia, and they are changing on a daily basis, like minute, ba- minute by minute, minute by minute. I mean, even probably while we're doing this podcast, there'll be probably you know a couple, uh, maybe a dozen other people that have died, a bunch of children. It's it's really, really, really shocking, Nadia. 
I want to, you know, I, I'm going to pull up our first story here. Let me let me share the screen so our um, viewers can 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 join. So this is from the Washington Post. It says that young Muslims, U.S. Muslims, are rising up against Israel in unlikely places. And you know, I think that as I mentioned at the top, like this is a big issue for the American Muslim community. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I know now that you're really active on social media, I I go on every once in a while, mostly on Twitter these days. Um, and there are a lot, a lot of posts in my feed and in your feed. I don't know if that's the case for regular, you know, Americans, but I know sure. in the in the American Muslim community, those that are online, like this is front and center what most of the people that I know are talking about or posting about. I don't post a lot, but, you know, I... I I guess now that my first question to you is like, why is this such a big deal in the American Muslim community? Why is it that American Muslims are posting about this so much? Yeah. So, I, you know, I don't want to represent like all Muslims. So I'll, I'll, what I'll be represented of is of um, friends, family, net, my network. And then, of course, um, you know, conducting um, a research study based off of the American Muslim experience mm, yeah. in the workplaces. So I can tie a little bit of kind of what I've been researching in um, for sure. But I, I think what's interesting is, of course, this is a, a huge story top of mind for, I would say, m the majority of Muslim American Muslims right now and globally, right? Muslim, the global community, not only the global community of Muslims, but like the global majority. Um, so black, brown folks all across the world. And what's interesting is that, yes, of course, like whatever we want to call it, it lack of a better word, um, this conflict, this war, this, some folks are calling it a genocide that will be determined next week yeah. in court. Um, but I think what's interesting is that this has been top of mind for a number of decades. Yeah. Um, and I think with the, you know, advocacy of social media and seeing something so um, instantaneously and seeing something so constant and stream being able to streamline kind of, uh, I'm sorry, not streamline, be, being able to see something stream, uh, you know, streaming on social media. Right. I think that that is something that makes it so relevant and makes folks so furious. And so um, aggr I don't even know what the right words are because there's such a roller coaster of emotions that people are feeling yeah. um, where they are experiencing like this, there's tremendous grief Um around this situation yeah and so yeah you know i think now the what 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 i'm seeing with this article gets at that we were talking about is that a lot of people are channeling that energy and that rage and that grief into protesting across the country right and and we're seeing it the article talks about how it's children of immigrants it's across the country in both small and large communities in both small and large protests have you been to any protests nadia I haven't been to any uh, protests in person yet. Um, I was in D.C. when the first kind of major one early in November was occurring, uh, but I wasn't able to make it. I choose to focus my advocacy and protesting through my research. Um, that's just a better space for me to focus my time on. Yeah. But yeah, there's been multi I think every every week in the boss i live in boston so every week in the boston area there's at least three to four protests a week for sure there are major protests yeah. that are occurring yeah. and then when you think nationally there's a major one um coming um in washington dc next week uh this this coming weekend actually totally or depending on when you air this last weekend <laughs> <laughs> yeah i um I, as you know i was in in october i was in New York City and taking the subway and I, I was getting back to the place where I was staying late at night and I walked out the doors of Grand Central Station and literally like the the protest <laughs> was like arriving at the station while I was yeah. leaving. And so it was, you know, I was there and uh, it was interesting to 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 be a part of it and um, or to see it. Uh, but yeah, well, as you mentioned, it's, it's happening all over the place. And I think, you know, the article, I just, you know, going back to the article, it it is it talks about how, you know, um, it's creating a sense of community among Muslims who mm -hmm. only recently uh, would not have dreamed that they could pull, put off or pull off such gatherings, which I found really interesting. Uh, mm. You know, like, um, I think for me, for our, you know, you and me, now that you were in our 40s, we kind of came. Whoa, of age. whoa, whoa. Oh, whoa. oh sorry, sorry. 
<laughs> the kind of came of age post 9-11, you know, the, the other yeah. comparable kind of gathering that wasn't just the American Muslim community, but others was uh, protesting the Iraq war. And that's something that I yeah, vividly sure. remember doing and, and being a part of. And so, you know, I think for a lot of young people, um, a lot of American Muslims, this is like, you know, uh, their, their, their big issue and they have no problems, you know, uh, voicing that. Yeah. I, I mean, so again, this is for me and my network and I know kind of like us of you and I, even though we grew up in the same home and we kind of practice in very similar ways, we had different groups of, we had different groups of friends. We had different networks. And when I went to university, my big network of people was the MSA, right? The Muslim yeah, Student right. Association. Muslim yeah. And when you think of like that group of people, um, that's community right there. And and so I'm not surprised that across like what this article was kind of referencing was like across universities and college campuses, the MSA, the Muslim students, the Arab students, the Palestinian students, and even um, folks that are alliances with, with Muslims um, or Palestinians are very active right now. Yeah. And I'll also just add that, like, yeah, a visible protest of someone marching or silently protesting is, is is a form of protesting. But so is like boycotting or shopping in certain places, donating to certain um, organizations to, you know, kind of aid in humanitarian work. Those are all forms of protesting. Sure. So we're seeing that across the board. And it's also really interesting because if you think generationally, like our father is so like if he could go to a protest, I think he would. No, really? <laughs> like, I think he would. I think that I if he like didn't, wasn't afraid of crowds like I am, I think that he <laughs> yeah. totally would. But he likes to watch things on TV. But, you know, I think that generation is also like growing up, we were you and I were told, like, don't talk about Palestine, Israel. Like we knew a lot about it. At least I remember learning a lot about it. I had Palestinian friends in college. Um, I had Jewish friends that would talk about it as well. And I, and I, I remember our dad saying to us, like, don't talk about Palestine, Israel. It's yeah. not something that is welcome to talk about. You will be framed as an anti-Semite. And so let's just keep quiet about yeah. it. And and that is still an issue that goes on today. The article even talks about it, how pro-Palestinian protesters have been cast by critics as Hamas sy sympathizers or anti-Semitic. And, you know, the new protesters say, you know, the article say that, you know, that's unfair. And I completely agree. Um, you know, now the, I think the other thing that it, before we move on that I think is really key about this article is that they say that it really showcases the emerging power of uh, the emerging political power of American Muslims. And mm -hmm. there's been a lot of conversation as we move on to our next story, which is, you know, essentially yesterday or the, earlier this week, um, you know, Biden uh, was interrupted while he was giving a speech in South Carolina with with chance of free Palestine. You know, it's not the first time and won't be the last time that things like this happen. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, now the Muslim voters overwhelmingly supported Biden and helped him, you know, carry a lot of states, including Michigan, including Virginia. Um, and this is going to be a big, it is a big issue now, mm -hmm. and it's going to be a big issue this year. How do you think about it? You know, first, it's like way too early to decide, but I, I'll say like, <laughs> yikes, that's yeah. like the only word I have. We are, I, th you know, our family's pretty political. Um, we are very in tune with, we stay on top of politics throughout the years, not just like an election cycle. And um, I, I, I agree. I think that our, I think family and friends, Muslim community, Arab communities, Palestinian communities, I think that a lot of us are starting to con reconsider um, someone like Biden who is choosing to not really, um, you know, take a stance or has taken a stance he's and taken the stance that he's definitely taken a stance. Um, <laughs> yeah. But what's, what's interesting is like, I think when we get down to it, like which one is the lesser of the two evils. And that's what like, I fear because, you know, we had during the Trump era so much Isla the rise of Islamophobia, Islamophobia and, right, and right. anti-Muslim sentiment, hate crimes, discrimination, bias, all of the above. Um, which is still occurring, obviously. And, and it, it, it is so, you know, the Jewish community is experiencing it too, in terms of anti-Semitism. but it's like, so many people are disappointed in Biden and his, his stance and yeah. lack of support towards this humanitarian crisis. Totally. And, um, I, I think 
leading up to November this year will be really interesting to watch. We talked about it on our podcast just recently on Inclusive Collective, and it's going to be a really wild Your award winning ride. Podcast is our award winning oh, podcast. podcast. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Let's take a listen now to what what happened uh, this week in, in South Carolina. That's all right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you can, you know, you, in the video, you can see them being escorted out of uh, the church uh, while finding cell at the podium. And, um, and then the crowd now you can hear responding to by saying four more years, four more years. Yeah, Navi, I think that this is going to be <laughs> this is going to be at your life. It's wild. I, I love totally politics. Wild, right? I know. Yeah, I, I mean, this kind of stuff I, I, I love. And um, it's, it's interesting what makes because, a thriving um, democracy, right? It is. You're right. Um, what's interesting, though, is last night um, my congresswoman was um, was inaugurating the most recent council board. And it was a beautiful ceremony. I wasn't there, but I saw videos. Um, beautiful ceremony of the of the new mayor and 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 um, inaugurating uh, the new council folks on the on the uh, within the town, and the congresswoman was speaking and the same chant um, by uh, constituents. Four more years or free Palestine? No, it was oh. free Palestine, okay. and it was ceasefire now and okay, asking yeah. why uh, my congress rep hasn't. Um, and I think this is how, you know, small town yeah. America across the board. Also, like this is happening. We're seeing videos of go viral on social media of like senators, Congress reps, even like, you know, town councils being um, asked why they haven't made, a, 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 you know, a, a statement. So, mm. yeah, really I mean, interesting. Uh, it, 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 I, I just don't understand how now three plus months. 25,000 people dead, all the stats that we said at the beginning, how you cannot call for a ceasefire now. Um, it's it, it's it, called it's, election. It's called <laughs> campaign finance campaign, reform. Yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> no, it's just, it, it, it's crazy. And so, you know, I'm just pulling up now this article uh, from the Hill. This was ba also back in December, but I thought it was an important to, thing to talk about. And they write about how Arab Muslim and uh, Arab and Muslim Americans could abandon Biden Democrats and their warning you know, advocates. And, you know, the article goes on to talk about how a spokesman for the Biden reelection campaign told the Hill that the president is working with leaders in the Muslim and Palestinian communities, including, uh, you know, about countering rising Islamophobia, which is obviously, you know, uh, a separate thing. But that person said that, quote, President Biden knows the importance of earning the trust of every community of upholding the sacred dignities and rights of all Americans. Um, it, it, that was in a statement. And I don't know, it, it, to me, it seems like he's just paying lip service to the American Muslim community, right? Like mm -hmm. it's, it's one of those things where he knows that it's either him or Trump. And at the end of the day, I think he's, he's betting on that. A lot of people, a lot of American Muslims, a lot of Arabs will vote for him over Trump. If it, mm. if it comes down to that. Right. I think you're right, and I and I don't think that that's going to be the case. And I'll tell you, and I don't know. Well, if you don't you know think this. it's going to be Trump versus Biden? Is that I what think. You're it, well, I don't know. Nikki Haley's kind of getting in there, Nabrita. <laughs> <She's, she's>, <laughs> um, what I will, or Vivek, maybe. But what I will say is, um, I don't know if you watch The Young Turks. It's kind of like a. Um, it's I a don't. Yeah, it's a media it's a independent. Company. Yeah, news uh, left leading. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, so. Yeah. One of the leading um, anchors on that production team or on that um, t yeah. TV show is uh, Jank Uger. Uger. I apologize if I misannounced the name. He's running. Yeah. There's a lot of people <laughs> he, running. He's running. And so it's just funny. It's interesting to me because there are a lot of people that want to oppose Biden or trying to make like this stance. And of course, we, you know, we understand politics in America and, and, um, and, and you know, especially when we get to the primary season, it's going to be a really, like I said, wild and interesting roller coaster ride. 
for the next, you know, yeah, nine totally. months, 11 months. Yeah, the article goes on now. They had to say that the executive director of the U.S. campaign for Palestinian rights said uh, that, you know, basically Biden's, you know, unwavering support of Israel for Israel and, you know, uh, his and denouncement of any criticism towards Israel's military shows politicians um, are on the wrong side of history and that he says voters of color in particular see this as a pattern. Um, what do you think about that? I mean, as soon as you started see, you know, saying that, my media thought was just within my own network, I would say like seven of my BIPOC, so outside of being American Muslim, so I'm saying like black friends, Asian friends, indigenous friends, Jewish friends, they all are not for Biden right now. Mm, they wow. are so Biden has a problem. It is not just going to be American Muslims. It's not just going to be, you know, um, Arabs or Palestinians. It's going to be black people. Yeah. It's going to be indigenous. Indigenous people in America have felt this for, for yeah, generations. For sure, for sure. This is if it is deemed a genocide, which the majority of people think it is. But when the lawyers deem that it is. Or the court deems that it is. It, this is going to be something that Biden is going to have to go home yeah, and reflect this is, on. This is a, a big part of his legacy right now, um, especially if it's only a four-year term. The the word that they use in the article a couple times where one of the, the, the people quoted is betrayal. And I thought that was, you know, that that to me seems like a the right word. And it seems like a lot of, as you mentioned, a lot of these communities of color, a lot of these minority communities are have felt betrayed by Biden and the Democratic Party. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I, I'm, I, you know, I get nervous, you know, but I, I guess, you know, for me, I like, I, I voted for Biden, Biden last time. I don't think I'll be voting for him again this year. Um, mm -hmm. I'm usually voting third party, um, though my wife tries to advocate for me not to do that <laughs> like <Ralph laughs> um, because Vader. I don't like the the two party <laughs> system or being forced yeah. uh, being forced upon us. But you know, now there's a lot of stuff happening in the next week. I'm really excited about you know Iowa and New Hampshire. They're right around the corner, mm -hmm. um, and so yeah, we'll see. You know what the early um, early returns of the primaries, uh, how they all shake out for sure. Yeah. It's going to be a fun year. Yeah. Now then, let's take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll talk more news headlines. This is American Muslim project. Welcome back to American Muslim Project. My guest today is my sister and uh, Favorite. Consult <laughs> my consultant and podcast host, Nadia. But um, Nadia, next story up. I saw this this week and I thought it was actually uh, really cool. Um, I don't particularly like him, but, you know, here's the article up on Reuters. Uh, Sam Altman, who is the head of OpenAI, you know, the ChatGPT stuff, um, he put out a tweet that says Muslims in the tech world fear retaliation um, and, you know, basically expressing concern about the Muslims and Arabs um, in uh, the tech industry. And so he said in his quote, uh, sorry, in his tweet, is it still a tweet if it's on X, Nadia? I think it's an, it's an, I don't know how to say it. it is it an X? <laughs> <laughs> it's an X. I think you're right. <laughs> he said, no, I, I'm going to stick with tweet for now until I know better. Cause X sounds uh, like uh um, not the right things to say. Anyway, he said yeah. Muslim and Arab, especially Palestinian colleagues in the tech community I've spoken with feel uncomfortable speaking about their recent experiences, often out of fear of retaliation and damaged career prospects. Um, uh, just really, you know, for someone like this at his level to come out and say this, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I think it's pretty remarkable and, um, really helped to kind of, uh, um, you know, uh, allow Muslims in the workplace to, you know, hopefully can, you know, feel, feel a little bit better now that you do research on this stuff. How did you feel about this? Yeah. So <clears throat> I, I think like the, the first thing to recognize is a couple things is like what he said and the action and the action that he talked about, which I really appreciated was that he said he spoke to mm. people, right? He spoke to Muslims. He spoke to Palestinians. He spoke to people within his sphere. So I can't um, just talk. For, I can't just speak 
about other people without talking to them. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> yeah. So what I'm saying is that he went to he went to seek to understand mm. how the 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 sentiments of how people are feeling. Yeah. I think that's the first thing to leadership is like really getting a, a grip and understanding how your employees are feeling. I talked about this in an article in a Forbes article that I contributed to um, back in December where. Really, leaders should take the time to seek and understand employee sentiment. Mm. So for me, it's nice to see not just a leader go and talk to um, people and understand. And again, I understand that this is, you know, Sam Altman, say what you will about him. But the fact that his leadership qualities, you know, his, his leadership capability of going to speak to someone, understand sentiment, be able to process and reflect on that. He's also a Jewish leader. I think him really advocating for the protection of not just the Jewish community, but also yeah. the Arab Muslim and Palestinian community totally. speaks volumes. Yeah. You know, and, and someone responded to that tweet basically being, you know, what about, what about the Jewish community? And, you know, he said in response, you know, I am Jewish. I believe that anti-Semitism is a significant and growing problem in the world. And I see a lot of people in our industry sticking up for me, uh, you know, him, um, uh, which he deeply appreciates, but he sees much less of that for Muslims. Um, again, a great, you know, like I, I think for him to say this at his level, I think is really important. Um, so again, someone who's Jewish, someone in the tech industry, someone who other business leaders um, look up to and trust. Follow, follow. Sure. Yeah, I think that's you know you don't see you don't see Elon saying <laughs> saying this. You don't see Elon saying that. No, it's important, right? It's like it's like you you need folks who are not of that minoritized group to be able to speak. Um, what kind of advocacy they might need. Yeah. You know, I think we'd be remiss to mention like CARE, the Council on American Islamic Relations. Um, it's a civil rights organization and they reported something crazy that like hate crimes have been up 300% since October 7th. Um, you know, for, for Muslims, it's not just anti-Muslim sentiment, but it's also Islamophobia. And, and this is in addition to, yes, of course, like the Jewish community are also experiencing hate crimes and discrimination, um, anti form, different forms of anti-Semitism. None of this is OK. Yeah. Um, but what I in my in my sphere, in my research, I see more of the advocacy and protection for the Jewish community and not so much for the Muslim community. Mm. So it's really refreshing to hear a leader uh, speak on behalf of both yeah. and really advocate for both groups of people. Yeah, totally. All right, now let's move on to one of uh, just one of the most horrific stories that um, uh, has happened recently, uh, locally at least, uh, not not globally. Um, let me, yeah. So now the you know another story here. This is out of New Jersey, um, the Spotlight News, and that's the murder of a New Jersey mom. Um, did you hear this story, Nadia? I heard about this story. I don't know. Um, I didn't read this particular article, but yeah, yeah I heard so, about the story. So basically, you know, we've been following this. Um, Imam Hassan Sharif in Newark was killed in a shooting outside of his mosque, which was called the Masjid Muhammad. Um, uh, sorry, the Masjid Muhammad Newark in the early morning hours, and he was pronounced dead that afternoon. The shooting remains under investigation, and authorities say they have no evidence of a hate crime at this point. But obviously, now the others. A lot of concerns within the New Jersey, New Jersey Muslim community, and uh, honestly, you know, throughout the Muslim community uh, across the country as well. Care, which is the, as Nadia mentioned, the Council on Islamic um, American Islamic Relations, uh, a, a rights a rights group. Their New Jersey chapter actually criticized officials for what they said was uh, a rush to attribute um, the death to urban violence without a complete investigation. Um, you know, I, I hope that they continue to investigate this. Um, here's some sound that uh, we found from uh, the family paying tribute. And I just want to say thank you for all of the support from everywhere, overseas, everything. We appreciate it. And it just speaks to who he was as a person. Everybody is doing their best to support us. And, and I, like, once again, I cannot, I cannot describe how it makes us feel knowing how many lives he touched and to the killer we'll find they'll find you i'm sure of it 
now the thousands of people attended the funeral, as you can imagine, he was a rel- well-respected imam and, and community figure. I think he was there for, for five years, the, the article said. Um, and he was only 52 years old. He was a husband and a father. And um, there are rewards now leading for any information to the rest. I think there, this article says 35K. I saw some other um, things uh, earlier today that said 50K. I couldn't really figure out what that the number was, but a significant amount of money leading to the arrest. What are your thoughts on this, Nadia? You know, <clears throat> I, I don't know too much about it. I, um, I get really nervous um when i hear about a killing at like a mosque or any religious um site like whether it's a church or a synagogue um i can't help but think that it would be based off of um some form of discrimination or or bias towards that group of people um so i do think that there's validity and and the care new jersey pushing back and saying like well let's wait to see what the investigation says instead of like having an underlying, um, you know, kind of like a, a statement to yeah. suggest that it wasn't bias or discrimination. Um, what I will say is that we saw such, this is a, such a sad story as are so many other stories that we're hearing of people being just killed and murdered for maybe who they are and what they believe in. Um, and I think what I struggle with, and I'd be curious, like if you also struggle with this, but earlier on back in, say like November, December, there, there was quite a number of like, um, at least on the news, what I saw was there was a quite a number of, um, you know, police officers, um, or, uh, different detail kind of outside of synagogues and temples in various cities to protect, um, students, to protect teachers, to protect, uh, you know, the staff of of those synagogues and temples. And that's, I, I get that. I understand the protection that's needed, but, What I would say is almost like a double standard where there has been no call to protect mosques. Mm. There's been no call to protect the Muslim community. So I would just I would say, like, let's protect the mosques as we would protect synagogues. Let's protect Muslim community as we protect the Jewish community centers. Let's protect imams as we would protect rabbis. You know, like it's essentially stopping the anti-Semitism and the and the anti-Muslim hate. Yeah, Um, I just that. Did you feel like a. A, a double standard at all in yeah, some of that rhetoric? I did not. Or... I think. I think for me, I I think while there's a lot of information and data, or or people claiming that you know anti-Semitism and Islamophobia are on the rise, you know, I think that you have to really dive deep into the data behind it a little bit, and like how much of it is actual physical actions um, against people versus against you know objects or buildings uh, versus how much of it is just rhetoric, which again is obviously very, all of it is very serious, Mm -hmm. but you know, I I think that like, you know, we saw the murder of the, the, that rabbi um, Mm -hmm. uh, a couple months ago, you know, this murder as well. Like, I think like really understanding if it is all connected or if it is just a, you know, random violence or even if it is Islamophobic, which, you know, maybe it is, um, uh, like, is, is that a result of, or is that, (laughs) are these incidences outside of the norm? Um, and again, I think, I don't think all of of the incidents should be outside the norm, but yeah, yeah, yeah. right. Like there's, there's always going to be Islamophobia. There's always going to be anti-Semitism. I'm not condoning obviously any of that, but you know, I think like, at what point do you need to call the police to stand guard outside of a synagogue or a, um, yeah, a I, mosque? I, I I don't know the answer, and and I don't it know could either. be that we're in the midst of that, and and obviously there's no harm in 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 doing that, right? Yeah. But um, yeah, I think I, we're I think it's like right now such a different time than prior to October seventh, and especially in America, it's well, and it's probably similar to like the UK or maybe um, in Australia, but maybe even Canada, but there definitely seems to be an increased amount for both Muslims and the Jewish community or just anyone. But is it just rhetoric or is, and will that rhetoric then translate into? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, You know, I'm on the, for example, I'm on the anti-defamation league website and there's several assaults that are listed that, 
um, you know, for people carrying flags and being, you know, um, pushed or called a terrorist or, you know, um, hit. And I, I don't, I don't know. Like, are these regular <laughs> things that would happen if you yeah, were going I to like know. a Patriots game? Probably not. <laughs> um, so it's all I, certainly concerning. I, I think the data from the ADL, as you just mentioned, uh, there are a bunch of sources that say that, that e- that is even flawed as well, because then now they're, they're including, um, anything that's anti-Zionist as an anti-Semitic, anti-Semitic incident. So like, I think like all this data, and again, now that we, you know, I, my other podcast is called Invisible Hate. We yeah, focus right. on hate crimes that are happening, you know, to uh, minority communities. And so like, obviously the stuff happens there and it happens a lot. Um, I, yeah, I think that like, it's cause for concern. I think even, even still, like I have so much, I guess faith in the humanity. Yeah, I guess I have more more faith in humanity and the American community I'm that so we are cynical. more we're more accepting and like yeah. uh, that we don't need to put guards outside of these places um, right. because we live in such a uh, an amazing society. Yeah, there's always going to be problems with people. But yeah, um, I don't know. That's how I feel. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's a valid point. Um, you know, I'm not advocating for like there to be police or guards like outside of every single church or synagogue or, or mosque. But I think at a time like right now where there is such an increase and in sensitivity around um, uh, the in particular these two faiths or just um, I, I think it's. Yeah. It's it's sad. But yeah. the other thing to keep in mind is like there's a lot of things happening in the workplace, right? So outside of even the communities or protests on the streets, like there's a lot of things happening in the workplace. And I think your next story has yeah. just that. Let's 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 go. Thank you, Nadia, for that transition. You're... Wow. Look, are you, are you a podcaster? <laughs> Nadia, are you are you a podcaster? Um, so yeah, let me pull this an up. Award so this is yeah, an award-winning podcast. Award-winning podcast. Now the about, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so yeah, this story is out of um, Georgia. This is from CNN. So Benjamin Reese, a 51-year-old seventh-grade teacher at a middle school in Warner Robins, Georgia, was fired recently from his job after being charged with making terroristic threats and being cruel to children. This happened. The incident happened late last year, but he just got fired, you know, just recently in in um, the last couple of weeks. I think mm-hmm. it was actually this past week he got fired. But witnesses say that he threatened to behead a student over comments she made about the Israeli flag hanging in the classroom. The student's mm-hmm. family told CNN uh, this week that they learned that um sorry that they heard from the media first not the school about the threats which Ooh, <laughs> to ouch. me is like probably <laughs> one of the most egregious things about this story um um yeah. you know like when things happen like this you got to tell you got to tell the parents right um, you got to tell the parents <laughs> like what um, is happening so yeah basically on december 7th he yelled at three girls in the hallway he said things like quote you motherfucking piece of shit um, I'll kick you in the ass. Um, I should cut your motherfucking head off. Another teacher nearby said that they heard Reese call one of the three students, my quote, my anti-Semitic friend. Um, uh, oh, and, wow. it, you know, I think this all stemmed from Reese being upset that the students might have been disrespecting the flag um, okay. that he had up. Um, and then, you know, a teacher also said that they heard him yelling, about one of the students that quote, she is a stupid motherfucker and I will drag her by the back. Uh, I'll drive her by the back of, of my car and cut her fucking head off for disrespecting my Jewish flag. Um, just a lot of, a lot of crazy things. Um, yeah. So now I guess for, first, what's your reaction? Disturbing, unhinged, um, I'm saddened that this is a teacher who, like, you know, most parents, you're, you're a parent now, like, um, really trust leaving their children, yeah. you know, in school with a uh, adult kind of supervisor. And it, it's um, problematic when this happens. And I think, like, this um, school system did the right thing of, of letting this person go. I am concerned for this individual. I think there there was a lot happening. Um, this this war has caused a lot of interesting 
um, reactions from people. I mean, I know I've shared with you like personal, you, like you said, I'm pretty social, I'm pretty active on social media within my own personal network. I received a couple of um, kind of hateful messages. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think people, and, and, and I would say from people that aren't normally so reactive in that yeah. manner. Sure. And again, this is such a sensitive topic for so many people. Yeah. Um, I'm not at all making any, um, you know, justifications for behaviors. Um, so I guess I think, now they, let me let me ask you, like, what what you know, if you're that if you're a teacher in this in this in this position and you see someone disrespecting something like that and you're, no emotions are high, like, what is the right reaction? For, by him what is the right reaction by the school like how do you think about this as a leader who maybe you see someone on your team that is like really like just raging about something regardless of what yeah. issue it is like you know how would you well, give me a, give me some advice yeah i mean so i'm not a, I, I don't work in the school system there's a reason for that but if this happened in the <laughs> workplace what i would say is like there's conflict management there's conflict management techniques that you can use to kind of like mitigate a situation. Um, I mean, this did happen to me on a very less scale, but like I was attacked behind the scenes by an individual who was make who wanted me to condemn certain groups. Um, and recently? I was singled out recently and mm. I was singled out because I'm Muslim. Mm. And so it takes, and did I handle the situation accordingly? I'm not sure, but I, what, what I, what I believe to do is like, to bring this to the people who have power and so to suggest someone who's trying to like prod you into doing or saying something and and you had to react. Yeah, and and someone might call that entrapment mm. and I felt entrapped. <laughs> um <laughs> and I'm not making light of it. It was a very sense it was a very serious and very scary situation for me cuz my um, profession was on, you know, was jeopardized. Yeah. And, um, so what did I you think, do? So bringing it to leadership and bringing it to people who have power to say, this is a, and I did not engage or react with this individual. I made sure I was safe. I made sure that person was safe. I made sure the situation was safe. And I brought it to people with power. And he said, this is how I saw the situation. And I would like something to be done about it. And again, I don't know if that's the right way to approach it, but that's how yeah, I approached it. Sure. And when I think about leadership behavior and I think about other conflicts that have, you know, have, have happened in the workplace, I do believe that these are, there's avenues. If, if there's a trusting culture and in a culture where you feel psychologically safe to be able to do that, then that should be the mechanism in which you can, or you should be able to have the conversation with that individual. But if you feel yeah. that individual might be unhinged or may not be receptive to what you are giving feedback on, <laughs> then, then the next alternative is to bring it to people with power. Yeah. I think, you know, this is, you know, I know that we started with uh, this, this teacher in Georgia, but I think actually this is really good to kind of uh, double click on. And that is, you know, because I think a lot of American Muslims are feeling angry at times um, and, you know, even angry in the workplace. If they're checking their social media, if they're checking the news and seeing stuff that happens, you know, so I think people people are definitely on edge. And so I think, you know, your advice here is is, is straight on. And, and you know, I, and if you don't feel like you have people in power that will support you, then go to care. That's why we have care. Care is a civil of, rights organization Americans right yeah. go to your go to your local police department if you don't feel safe like don't um react in a way that that you um will put jeopardize yourself or jeopardize other yeah. people and their safety yeah i think um i think also you know what i had to do um uh, is i had to get off of social media too and um mm -hmm. that was overwhelming for me in terms of uh, affecting my emotions. And I know it's a privilege to be able to, to, to tune that out and, and just, you know, I'm still obviously reading about stuff, but you know, for, for whatever reason, that kind of doom scrolling uh, late at night or, you know, uh, um, you know, downtime, which just wasn't, wasn't good for me. Um, yeah. So, yep. Okay, now the whew, some serious stuff. Serious stuff, and we're not serious <laughs> Sorry, people. I know like, what's going on. Okay, <laughs> let's take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll end with a nice story about everyone's favorite Muslim actor and comedian, Rami Youssef. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to American Muslim Project. My guest again today is um, one of my two favorite sisters. I only have two, so I have to say that in case the other one is listening. Well, you have a sister-in-law too. So oh, I have, right. yeah. So one of three. Yeah, yeah so that's, that's right. Um, Nadia Butt, who is, uh, amongst other things, working on her dissertation that is about, in one sentence, Nadia, what can you say? Uh, the lived experiences of Muslim Americans in the workplace. Oh, that's not bad. Okay. Uh, I look forward to reading it when it's done in seven years. Um, I'm not allowed to make that <laughs> joke, <laughs> joke, by the way. Um, anyway, so uh, let's conclude with this uh, last story. So this is a story from our FON website. If you don't know about FON, um, it's uh, a website that um, showcases all the cool creative projects um, and the arts that American Muslims are working on, createfon.com. So Rama Yusuf was at the Globe. The Golden Globes this past weekend now as part of the cast for Poor Things, which is winning a bunch of awards, yeah. um, which I've heard might not be like, you know, everybody's cup of tea, but okay. uh, I'll watch it at some point. Um, and he used this platform there when he was walking the red carpet um, and talking to reporters to call for a ceasefire. Um, in Palestine and you know he did it just in in kind of typical Rami way while discussing um, his friend Jeremy Allen White of the show well, well, what is the show called I'm drawing a blank now it's called um... oh my goodness oh my god the bear the bear thank you the bear Producer I was thinking Ari. of the other <laughs> Producer Ari <laughs> chatting the with show? the bear but what yeah. was the other show he was on before that <laughs> oh I don't know anyway I, I, I totally like I could not remember anyway so when he was discussing his 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 friend Jeremy Allen White of the bear you know he's in a new so Jeremy Allen White is in a new Calvin Klein commercial where mm -hmm. you know he's yeah oh, his you, undies oh is that a mm, or is that a, oh a, um, mm. anyway <laughs> Rami humorously touched on the ongoing violence in Gaza saying we're all thinking of two things ceasefire now and Jeremy Please don't do another Calvin Klein ad. If I was a better comedian, I would have delivered that a lot better. But, you know, I appreciate him just, again, shining the light um, a little bit in the way that he can on the ceasefire. Um, yeah. And so uh, good on him. Um, he also, at, at the <laughs> Golden Globes, uh, kissed his co-star, co uh, Mark Ruffalo, adding, you know, another <laughs> memorable and unconventional uh, moment to the celebration. So, you know, yeah. you know, we... I just want to share because he is one of the more um, famous American Muslims right now or Muslims in general. And, you know, it's important um, uh, that, uh, you know, he's able to do what he's able to do. So sure. yeah. now they have thoughts on, on Rami. Yeah, no, I thought he did it in a really like polite, professional, like satirical manner. Um, he I think he got his point across. Yeah, it was cool. I, I, I was hoping to see more people um, request a ceasefire, but I don't. Really yeah, well I think I think there the was Globes. I think it was pretty um, non-political. Um, we'll see how the rest of the awards season season plays out. You know, the Oscars are, are coming up, um, yeah. so I'm sure people will will, will say things. But yeah. that is going to do it for this week's episode of American Muslim Project. Uh, we'd love to know your thoughts. Please email us at info at rafalion dot com. That's Rafalion is our production company that puts this podcast and other podcasts, including my sister's podcast called Inclusive Collective, together. Uh, we'll be back next week with another episode. I want to thank Nadia and I want to thank producer Ari. Until next time, I'm Asad Button.